So, so this question of life versus non-life, um, I, I guess I did want to say, uh, to put a point of discussion out there, it's, it's certainly the physics of observers is not the whole story. When we talk about life versus non-life, we have entities that process information that are sort of intrinsic to compute, that are adapt, that are stable, self-maintaining, they make decisions and they take actions on their environment. And so uh, these issues, I, they certainly arise in fundamental physics, but, but I'm going to assume that we already are interested and have some of these examples and what are the basic physical properties that they must have to implement some of these uh, component processes that maybe are signatures of life. Um, and, and, and throughout the whole thing, and the theme, uh, which short talk may not be clear, is my, my approach is to be constructive. I want to be able to calculate things. I'm not interested in non-computable quantities um, uh, it's just after many years at the Santa Fe Institute talking about these ideas in the abstract, I just developed this, not quite an allergy, I'm still quite sympathetic to this, but at the end of the day I want to be able to calculate something. So I'm going to give you several models where we can calculate various thermodynamic properties in detail. So how am I going to do this? Um, well, first a hint a little bit about you know, what are these lifelike things, adaptive entities, self-maintaining non-equilibrium systems that arise through structural phase transitions kind of a physics take on the evolution of life. Um, I'll hint at a few things today. Um, not so much, or not at all going to talk about evolution. I just can't do that. Although uh, Josh, he tells me he's going to talk a little bit about evolutionary dynamics, which is very important in this whole topic. I would even claim going back to fundamental physics. I'll talk a little bit about sort of Maxwell's demons and uh, kind of a new uh, informational second law that outlines, extends Landauer's principle to talk about the thermodynamic costs of information processing and in physically embedded uh, com computing. And I can't help myself. I want to tell you about some new things. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking about now, not this, this other stuff. So, okay. So, um, I need to tell you where I'm coming from, and that is centered around the idea of intrinsic computation. What I'm interested in is looking at natural systems. Could be uh, uh, the engine in your car idling roughly in the cold mornings. It could be the waterfalls down at Longbow River. Uh, and, and I want to know how much historical information is stored in an instantaneous state, what the architecture of that information storage is, and how that information is used to, for the system to produce its future behavior. Each one of those three questions is actually answerable, and I'm going to talk about the consequences of that. So what I'm not going to talk about, as I said, evolution, and I'm not going to talk about statistical mechanics of learning. Those factor into how we think about adaptive intelligent agents. And I hope Susanna's still on the panel, and maybe tomorrow we'll talk a little bit about the statistical mechanics of learning. She's an expert in that. What I do want to talk about is uh, agency and interactions. And if we're lucky, I'll uh, hopefully get back to, uh, we'll finish up on, you know, doing, sorry, due do, do, do diligence on the uh, session theme, which is what is life? I actually have several answers. Okay, intrinsic computation. So this has been a 30-year <laughs> uh, uh, adventure. What I'm interested in is how the world forms patterns and structures. The point of this slide is that it happens all over the place. And it's also sort of kind of responsible for how we as uh, scholars partition up the world and move ourselves into different disciplines. Now the, notice the, the bottom citation there. This picture of the hierarchy in biology appeared in physics today. So at least some of us are arguing that this emergence of different levels of structure has something to do with physics, or physics maybe has something to say about this. Um, these days, I'm making the argument not that any one level is physics. We already have field biologists and molecular biologists doing that and being quite successful. But I think the question of the existence of the hierarchy is a question in physics. But then, what are these levels? How are they structured? How, how are the structures at one level different from another? Do we have a quantitative definition of structure? Look, we can all say that this system is hotter than this system, that this system is more disorganized, this that we have temperature, entropy. Why in statistical mechanics do we not have a measure of structure? It's clearly important. We're not going to be able to contribute to this kind of question unless we have a quantitative measure of structure. So that's kind of the main theme of what I'm going to do. Uh, and so kind of theoretical background, 
the way I approach this, I've mostly been working in uh, time series, nonlinear dynamics. I uh, worked early on in trying to explain the origins of turbulence and fluids. You might recall a very nice article by Heisenberg in the 50s where he championed fluid turbulence as one of the challenging problems in physics. Does anyone know why he wrote that essay in his later years? Because his dissertation was on that topic. And when he went for his dissertation defense, he was almost failed. I like the problem. And so there was the Landauer's proposal was that fluid turbulence is really just a whole set of symphonic oscillators incommensurately tuned. And just that combination of these different frequencies led to complicated fluid motion in the, well, going back to Poincaré in 1890s, but really in the 70s, Royal and Tawkins proposed that, in fact, these funny state space objects called strange attractors were responsible. And so I was part of the, the group of people that looked at turbulent fluids on the one hand and knew something about this nonlinear dynamics of these chaotic attractors and were sort of tasked ourselves with trying to make the connection. And the connection was an exercise in what I call pattern discovery. How can I go from maybe even detailed measurements, although they weren't very detailed, they had like one probe into the fluid, so we had a time series coming out. How can I go from a single scalar time series and reconstruct the picture of the behavior so that I can tell whether Landau is right or whether Ruel and Tawkins are right? Well, it turned out there's this method called geometry from a time series where you can take a single scalar and reconstruct by either delaying the signal against itself or taking successive derivatives. You have this reconstructed state space and you can study the question geometrically in this reconstructed state space. And then it's just a matter of pattern recognition. It wasn't a bunch of simple harmonic oscillators. It was these rather elegant objects that were fundamentally irreducibly ex exponentially amplifying small fluctuations to macroscopic scale in these compact, strange attractor structures. And so, Ruel and Tawkins are right. Landau was not correct in this arena of weak turbulence. So the background, that got extended to, oh, from a scalar time series, I can reconstruct a state space. If I have a state space, I'd like to actually get the equations of motion. So it turns out you can do that sometimes. If I have a state space, I can look at that state space an instant later, and the states have all evolved. Therefore, I can look at the mapping of the previous time t to the states at time t plus delta t, there's a graph of a function. Those are the equations of motion. So you fit the right-hand side of your differential equations to that, and you have your theory. Well, that doesn't always work. Do I use wavelets, uh, monomials, uh, hypergeometric functions? How do I? There's no natural notion of the right way to expand or fit to these functions, the dynamic. So I got interested in using some ideas from a theory of computation to give a more grounded way of talking about the simplicity of models. So I moved into the kind of pure time, discrete setting. And then the issue, the key issue, when we've heard this word a thousand times already, last day and a half, if I have a time series, what are the effective states in the system? How do I know what states, is there some way, to say it more directly, is there some way the behaving system through the time series of measurements tells me what its effective states are and what its equations of motion are? Does it tell me how it should be represented? I don't want to assume anymore. I don't want to assume Fourier transformations, hypergeometric functions, Taylor expansion. I don't want to assume. The question is, does the data tell me how it should be represented? And the question actually has a positive answer. So that's what I'm sort of working on. You go from some maybe very elaborated physical system, you close up the box, all you have is a time series, and you want to build a model. So what are these effective states? And this will kind of end the kind of uh, background part of what I wanted to say. What you say is the system is in the same effective state when histories at two different times lead to the same future behaviors. And by future behaviors, I mean the distribution over futures. So I'm comparing these past conditioned distributions over futures. And when those future distributions look the same, we say the system is in the same effective state or causal state. And you end up reconstructing a state-like diagram. This is too simple a diagram. Sometimes these sets of causal states are actually partial continua fractals or full continua or countable infinity of states. There's a whole range of different models, and that kind of leads to the richness and difficulty of doing this. One benefit from this is that we can go back and actually 
develop a quantitative measure of how random and unpredictable a system is. And this is the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy rate imported by the Soviet mathematician Kolmogorov from Shannon's information theory into physics to show that information theory actually has a physical basis. And what he proved was is this adapted notion of Shannon information, actually it's the creation of Shannon information, is a dynamical invariant and therefore has a sort of status. The interpretation is rather simple. It's the rate at which a system produces information, bits per unit time. You're trying to predict, that's the challenge. This new information coming up, I had to keep measuring. The other thing that comes out of this is having these causal states. You can show through this equivalence relation that they are, they give you the, an optimal predictor, which allows you to measure entropy rate. They're also the minimal set, and they're unique. So from that, my problem with the ambiguity of fitting polynomials to differential equations goes away. What I say is, since I have a minimal model, minimum number of states, I just say the com structural complexity of the system, this quantitative measure, is the amount of information in those causal states. So that's what's called the statistical complexity. We have this set of causal states, sigma. We just look at the distribution over time and quantify the amount of information there. So it's the Shannon information in the causal states. The state, to state, the state average transition uncertainty is the entropy rate. So this is nice duality, and you end up with this sort of kind of universal cartoon picture that if you look at a space of processes, you can think of your 2D easing system as a function of temperature. You can look at your chaotic system as you increase the nonlinearity parameter. You can look at your Bernard convection, increase the temperature difference. And across that whole range of systems, at each parameter setting, you measure how random the system is and how much stored information was used to produce that randomness. And then just make a scatter plot of those two quantities, and you end up with this kind of universal hump function. We call this humpology. At the extremes, completely predictable and completely unpredictable, we have simple systems. Completely predictable, obviously a simple model. Completely unpredictable, well, what do we do? When things are statistically unpredictable, we start using probability theory. So these are simple statistical models, small size. The lesson here is that it's in this intermediate range of unpredictability or randomness where systems are most structured and intricate. There's this amalgam of a little bit of determinism and predictability with sudden stochasticity that makes them complex. They store the most historical information as they produce their behavior. So then you can come back and actually answer these questions of intrinsic computation. How much historical information does a process store? That's the statistical complexity. What's the architecture that stores it? That's the set of causal states and the transition dynamic over it. And then how is it used to produce future behavior? Well, one measure of that is this information production rate, the, the, the entropy rate. OK, so now getting closer to the session theme or the task, life versus non-life. So I want to take these ideas now and think about agents in an environment of other agents. So. What we're going to do here is talk a little bit about Maxwell's demon. Everyone kind of knows Maxwell's demon, right? This neat-fingered, highly observant being tracks fast and slow molecules and sorts them by opening and closing a trap door so you get a temperature difference and then you can drive uh, uh, an engine, which then violates the second law. Of course, uh, this is what we're trying to uh, argue against. This is the paradox. It's a lot of work there, a lot of logical depth to put the, the wine glass back together. There's something about uh, the demon that is using this molecular information to reassemble the glass or somehow to do useful work is the argument. My favorite resolution of this, and there have been many, many others, is actually Leo Zillard's paper in 1929 on the decrease of entropy in a thermodynamic system by the intervention of intelligent beings. Even Maxwell ap appealed to intelligence, which seems kind of odd in fundamental physics papers to appeal to something vague like intelligence. So. He has a single molecule engine. I'll just quickly explain how it works. There's one molecule in a box. The demon puts a partition in and then observes what side of the partition the molecule is on. And the molecule is, say, on the left side. It allows the partition to move to the right. And then the molecular interactions with the partition allow it to extract PDV, energy. So you can go through and reinterpret Maxwell's, I mean, sorry, Zillard's demon here in terms of a mapping of the unit square. So what we do is we symmetrize the system under study, the single molecule thermodynamic system, and the demon. So we have the, the molecule can be either left or right, and the demon's memory can be either A or B. What does measurement correspond to? 
a correlation between the de demon memory macro states and positional macro states. So that's measurement that come into alignment. Extracting the energy, the, the demon just allows the partition to move, so this joint distribution is allowed to expand. And then you have to reset to start the cycle over. And probably the best way to show this is just, it, this is a cycle. There's, it's, this is the thermodynamic engine. It has three steps in it. You measure, the demon and thermodynamic system get correlated. You expand to extract, to use that knowledge to extract energy from the heat bath, and then you reset, and that's a cycle which I can just kind of show you here. But this animation helps illustrate an interesting point. Well, first of all, the most important point in terms of the physics is that there is one stage during this thermodynamic extraction where you move the partition, you're expanding the distribution. That's actually expanding the state space. That is the classic mechanism by which systems become deterministically chaotic, discovered by Poincaré in the 1890s. So these engines work because they're chaotic. So we make a connection here between basic thermodynamics and nonlinear dynamics of chaos. The other thing you notice is that I kind of colored the state space here just so you could see that originally there were some particles that started on the left and right. And you see this kind of phyllo dough sort of compl complexification of the joint distribution. Right? This is a self-similar structure, and it actually turns out the relative weights of these two things tells you about the measurement efficiency of the demon getting information about the molecular position. So I'll stop on uh, this last little uh, punchline here. So uh, you can calculate. So the thing I like about this model is everything can be done in the back of an envelope. I don't think there's any mystery about Maxwell's demon anymore. We've mapped it now into this two-dimensional chaotic dynamical system. Everything can be calculated. Stored information, the quote, the amount of intelligence, how random it is, and the thermodynamic costs. So what I'm showing you here is the dissipated energies due to erasure, resetting, due to measurement, and due to that feedback control step. And this should be a little bit familiar to some, like Charlie. This is Landauer's principle. It says that there is a cost of erasure here in purple, but measurement is free. Hmm. Actually, you can redesign Zillard's engine so the exact opposite is true. So those of you who've been hearing about Landauer's principle just being about erasure, that's, let's just say it's been generalized. It's not really true. You can see here, there's a whole space of different kinds of engineering degrees of freedom we have when we try to understand the thermodynamic costs of control and extracting energy from systems.